last season. Baseball's youngest team led the American League in stolen bases. And it was one of the top defensive clubs in the game. Holy smokes, Kyle Lewis! Featured two gold glovers in the infield. Are you kidding? That was gorgeous! Evan, why wow. making the catch? Plus another with the hardware in his trophy case. What a play! Don't forget, the unanimous AL Rookie of the Year. God home run, Kyle Lewis! You cannot stop number one. And top rookie starter. Justice Sheffield strikes out the side. With the Bulldog atop the rotation. Bulldog tough, you bet. Oh, and throw in one of baseball's best farm systems. And we've got one question. Are you ready for more? Mariners baseball, see us rise. It was a simple question. Are you ready for more? And the answer is yes. That video getting me pumped for the 2021 season. Hi, everybody. Angie Mentink here from Root Sports. And welcome to another 2021 Mariners Care Community Tour virtual event. This is actually our second baseball and softball clinic that we've done this year uh, that we have done virtually. And I'm so glad uh, that you all could join us for this for kids throughout the Northwest and coaches as well. During the program, we're going to be joined by two of my favorite Mariners alum. Um, so you're in for a treat. They will have a few drills and some tips to get you ready for your baseball and your softball seasons. So you might want to grab a notebook, grab a pen and take some notes because there'll be a lot of really great stuff coming up over the next half hour. And um, later, not a half hour, it's an hour. And uh, later in the program, uh, we're going to kind of turn things over to you and you'll get to ask all of your burning questions, baseball, softball. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are 12 years old or uh, 12 plus 42. Um, we'll have the answers for you. Um, so uh, I want to welcome in uh, the guys that will be helping me. And I'm going to start off uh, with Tom Lampkin. And I'm kind of like, I try in my role to be just sort of like a vessel uh, for you and just ask straight questions. But today I feel like I'm kind of like a starstruck fan uh, because the two gentlemen that will be joining me today um, are two of my favorites to talk the game of baseball with. And we're going to start with uh, Tom Lampkin. A little bit of background uh, with Tom Product of the Pacific Northwest, uh, he went to Bishop Blanchep High School, uh, stayed in the Northwest for college in Edmonds and at the University of Portland, drafted by the Indians, made his major league debut with them, then went to the senior circuit for a while, but eventually he came home to play for the Mariners, part of the 2001 team, which of course was one of the best teams in the history of the game, winning 116 games, Tom Lampkin. Um, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. And then kind of, if you will, catch us up on, on what you've been doing, and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, get into Bill. Hi, Angie. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it, uh, those were great years uh, looking back on them. But um, recently, I've, uh, I've kind of retired now, and um, I, I had about a 10 or 15-year stint as a, doing some general contracting things, but um, trying, to, trying to kind of lay low and do some traveling and working on my own property. Uh, keeps me busy uh, here down in Brush Prairie, Washington. So, um, so I'm enjoying life right now. Uh, I don't I don't get to watch a ton of baseball, but uh, but I keep up uh, with the Mariners a little bit and, and try to get up there and see you guys at least once or twice a year. Okay, how long does it take you to mow all of your property? Like if you had to put a time on? Well, it. <laughs> yeah. uh, about three three to four hours. My goodness, it's not right. bad. But it's fun. That's that's not a chore. It's playing in the yard, I call it. It's fun. Okay. Nice. Um, lucky us. Uh, we have another Northwest product to learn from. Bill Kruger uh, went to high school in McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, went to college also at the University of Portland on a basketball scholarship to start, no less. Uh, really didn't start pitching until his final year there. Took the load uh, or the road less traveled and signed as an undrafted free agent. Went on to pitch 13 seasons in the majors, including two different stints with the Mariners. Uh, but he was here helping save baseball in 95, part of that refused to lose team. Uh, Bill, I know that uh, after the last year and the offseason and everything else that we've had, you got to be chomping at the bit to, to get back to baseball. Well, yeah, yes, thank you. And uh, yes, uh, this is the pilot's uh, uh, show. So just keep that in mind. 
<laughs> it's fun to have Tom and me on. I love it. Uh, no, thank you. And, and, you know, the rhythm of the game, uh, you know, I've been really blessed that I got to play longer than I could have ever really imagined. I never even thought I'd, I'd be a major league baseball, let alone just to be a pro baseball player, but uh, to be able to continue in broadcasting and to have a, a presence on the product and to feel the rhythm of baseball. And this year it feels right. You know, last year was difficult and uh, we had to be patient. Uh, we were able to salvage a little bit of the season, but this year it feels right. It's exciting. There's hope in every club and certainly with the Mariners. And so uh, I'm, I'm excited to see the season start and, and this good young team get out there and play a little bit. I'm excited that you guys let this Husky join this pilots program. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you guys very much for that. Uh, we know as Bill alluded to that this has really been a, a challenging year for all of us, but especially um, our younger baseball and softball players. Um, and as we return to the fields of play, uh, we want to talk about maybe, maybe some things that kids can do um, to sort of ramp things up and, and, and sharpen their skills a little bit. And I'm going to start with you, Bill. What advice would you have for kids uh, during these times and, and, and things that they could do? Well, the whole adage for me is that if you want to have a good arm, you got to play catch. It's not so much that you have to pitch to have a good arm. I think if you play a lot of catch, I always tell kids it's 15 minutes of catch three times a week away from practice. And there really isn't an excuse. It'd be great if your dad goes out there and gets on one knee and gives you a target, but you can find a buddy. In my case, when I was really young, it was my mom. Uh, you can get your dog. You can find a wall. We used to play with a pinky ball and, 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 and tape a square on the garage door. There just isn't any other, any excuse for not getting out and using your arm. And, and I'll tell you this uh, for all those in the audience, the guys that lasted the longest played a lot of catch when they were kids. I guarantee you, when you look at guys like Nolan Ryan and Randy Johnson and Greg Maddox and some of these guys that pitch forever, I always say that every time you pitch, every time you play catch, you're like loading the battery. And the more you throw, the better your arm gets, the stronger it gets, and the battery gets bigger. So play a lot of catch. Yeah, Tom, I think that sometimes um, nowadays kids are so structured. So they have, you know, a, 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 an hour of baseball here and an hour of basketball there and an hour of baseball here, but that's kind of it. And they don't just go out and play for six, seven hours a day um, like you know, we did back when the dinosaurs roamed and we were growing up. Um, but, you know, as Bill alluded to, you, you don't even need someone else in, in these pandemic times. You, you need a, a tennis ball and a wall, right? Yeah, in some cases you do. And, and uh, you know, I, I, you know I, Bill brings up a good point. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't put a price tag on going back to the basics, especially early on in the season. When, um, when you maybe haven't thrown a lot in the off season or you've taken a couple months off, you know, I like to, when I was playing, I mean, a lot of, a lot of catch, definitely a lot of catch starting slow, building up to more time and a greater distance and then hitting off a tee. I always started off a tee when I would start in, in, you know, hitting again in October or November, December, start off a tee, get your, try to get your swing back, try to get your hands used to feeling a bat again, get your body used to twisting. Because ultimately, when you get out on the field, um, your adrenaline gets going a little bit and, and you do things a little bit harder and a little bit faster than you do when you're practicing. So if you don't kind of warm your body up to the same routine and the same moves that you go through during a game, um, then you might have a tendency to get hurt. So I was always kind of a I was very methodical when I would start my workouts in the offseason. I would usually start you know, playing catch in November, November 15th. And I'd start hitting up T in December 15th and just kind of ease into it from there. And, 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 you know, like I said, the, the fundamentals are where it starts. If you jump right into doing something and you start creating bad habits and, you know, they're, they're really tough to get rid of. I would agree with that. And one thing, you know, when I think about um, working with young kids, uh, boys or girls, softball, baseball, does not matter. Um, but one fundamental for me that I just really try to harp on the most is trying to keep your head still. Um, and, and if you can learn how to do that, it's going to fix a lot of ills. You'll, you know, you, it might be the front side flying. It might be a lot of uh, different things. Um, but one thing that I, I really um, feel strongly about is a great way to to work on that fundamental or that skill is to work off of the tees, like like Tom just mentioned, because you can have this really violent swing, but if you can keep that head still, and when you're done swinging, to really be close to where you made contact um, with the ball, you know that's that's a really good place to begin. So, and keep in mind, Bill, it's only a one-hour show. 
because I know you have a lot of these, but is there a certain fundamental drill that you like to do, whether it's pitching, whether it's hitting, um, that you really like to stress with um, young kids to kind of iron out a kink? Well, I think it, 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 it gets it gets rather boring because it's very methodical because, uh, you know, it's like keeping your head still. It's straight lines win. So if you can get yourself on a straight line to the plate, let's say you're just you don't necessarily have to talk about going into a full delivery. But if I were to take and make a T, whether it's in the dirt or on a on a gym floor and I use the back foot to be the top of the T and then my lead foot that I'm going to step toward the target on the other part of the T and I straddle that line and try to step straight down that line, good things are going to happen if you stride straight to the plate. And believe me, that that's a problem that if you don't fix, uh, it's going to cause problems. You're going to have arm problems. You're going to have location problems. So I would say, number one, step straight to the target. Number two, uh, make sure that your elbow is above your shoulder. Um, and release points are, 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 are different for every, every pitcher. Uh, some will be higher than others. But you don't want to drop down to have your elbow below your shoulder or throw sidearm uh, because those are, those are um, we're all going to be power pitchers to start with. Uh, the sidearm pitcher becomes a, a, a trick artist, a one pitch kind of guy, when the, when a one batter kind of guy when, when you work up in the game. He might be great at the 11, 12 year old because he can be intimidating, but the fact of the matter is physics rule. And when you drop your arm, the ball comes in on the same plane as the bat. So we're going to keep that elbow above our shoulder and we're going to step straight to the target. Um, I know there's a number of other touch points, but if I think if we can get those two going, that's a good place to start. Yeah, I, I would agree. You got to take care of, uh, of your wing, take care of your arm, uh, above all else. If you want to play this game for a long time, uh, Tom, uh, what's your take on this? And, and then we're going to, we're going to hear from a, a few, uh, current Mariners as well, but your take on, on a drill or something you really like to, to, uh, pass on to the next generation. <clears throat> well, uh, um, as a catcher, I would say, uh, you know, you got to get it. You got to force yourself to get in the position and catch, you know, uh, you don't, you don't become, um, you don't become, uh, uh, a good defensive catcher unless your body is used to getting into that position. And I know it, it kind of, it kind of sucks when you got to catch a lot of bullpens or when you have to do the drills, the blocking drills and stuff, but you need to force your body to get into that position. So, you know, a lot of the, you know, bouncing a ball off the wall and, and working on, you know, receiving and working on soft hands and working on, you know, I was, I like to catch the ball out in front of me when I was, when I was catching, um, a lot of drills where the ball bounces off the ball and you, you work on, you know, taking the ball out of your glove, working on your transitions. Those are all things that can be done by yourself, you know, in your shop or in your garage or in your basement or what I used to do it in our basement all the time, just bounce, throwing up the ball against the wall and pretending like somebody was stealing. You know, have somebody teach you the, the proper footwork. There's plenty of catching instructors out there that can teach footwork, um, you know, and then, you know, pushing the ball back behind your ear and trying to get it in your throwing hand, uh, you know, getting into a proper position to block the ball so that you're looking in a mirror and you're making sure that the holes are covered. I mean, those types of things that emphasize the defensive part of catching um, are just are, are, are stuff that it, it's kind of a lost art. I'm not saying that guys don't do it now. Cause I think there are guys that do, but um, you know, sometimes, and even when I was playing uh, there, you know, the, the problems of balls getting between catcher's legs is a problem, or, you know, the transition is a problem. So the more we can do those things in the off season in a controlled environment, a controlled situation, um, then the better are we are to execute them when we can't think about them. Yeah, Tom, right now I'm trying my best to raise a Tom Lampkin, a left-handed hitting catcher. And I will tell you this, he just got a new glove from Dave Valley and he has been working on his transfers all day. He's walking around the house, right. a catcher's glove on and just transferring uh, the ball. All right. That's so great. This is a team game and uh, our team's going to get a little bit bigger right now. Uh, we get some tips from Justin Dunn, Dylan Moore. They recently had a conversation with Mariners broadcaster, Dave Sims. Hi, everybody. I'm Mariner broadcaster Dave Sims. Good to have you with us today. We got two of the Mariners with us. Talk a little bit baseball and uh, talk about some drills and some things that you can do to get ready for your baseball and softball seasons. Dylan Moore is with us. Justin Dunn is with us. And fellas, um, as major leaguers, you know, in terms of fundamentals, fundamentals, you know, you got to have good fundamentals in life, but fundamentals in baseball. Let's start with you, Justin. What kind of fundamentals would you say, you know, would you ask a kid? 
they concentrate on and maybe some some of the stuff that you do yeah for me um i think the big one is balance and, and finish um my two favorite drills are a balance drill just kind of posting up on my back leg and getting my body gathered and then i'll go to a drill called um some people use rocker some people use wide base um, it's basically just kind of where I stretch out to the full length of my stride and I'll throw the ball forward to a catch partner or a catcher and just work on kind of getting my back down and getting my back flat because if I leave the ball up to hitters like Demo, so um, <laughs> my thought process is getting the ball down and, and focus on getting my back flat. Yeah, I bet. Too. What about you, uh, Dylan? Has that, you know, what, what do you do? What do you, what would you impart to kids? Um, yeah, I've done, a, I've done some, uh, a few drills that I've done for ever since I was a kid, you know, the T I, I still use the T, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things that's, you know, it's a non-moving ball. It's the easiest ball to hit. And obviously when you're a kid, that's how you learn how to hit. And so moving up through the ranks, you know, there's some very good players. There's some hall of fame players, um, that, that use the T their entire career. Um, and so I, I wouldn't get away from that. You've got to find out kind of what, uh, you know, what kind of uh, drill set that you like and that kind of makes you uh, sharpen your game. And then if that continues, you know, through the big leagues or through each level that you uh, that you get to, you know, you should continue to do that. And the T is one of those for me. It's been for a long time. You know, it, it's interesting when you look back on your career um, and you think about, and you guys are you know, still in, very much in your primes and everything, but maybe some things that you wish you had spent more time on when you were a younger player that you would say to a kid, you would recommend, Hey, you may want to try this. This, this could really work. I didn't do it. I didn't pick it up till later. You know, one of those kind of deals. Dylan, you want to, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, just play and catch. I think that sometimes um, just playing catch on the line, getting warm to play catch kind of goes, uh, maybe, maybe you're not, you don't have, doesn't have your full concentration. And that's really a time where you can, a work on your uh, accuracy with your throws when you get out far enough. It, you know, if I'm playing short stuff, I want to get to that 120 feet max throw that I'll have to maybe make and make sure a couple of them are on are on target while getting my arm warm. Um, sometimes, you know, there's there's a little bit of uh, unfocus there when I was a kid, and you know, it could have been a little bit better. And also, you can. Um, you know, you can go through a, some some relay cuts where you know you're 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 mimicking mimicking a relay throw from the outfield and throwing it to your partner. Um, there's all different types of uh, of things you could do during that 10, 15 minutes that you are warming up your arm to throw to get ready to do whatever you got to do. That I think uh, you know a little bit more focus uh, could go a long way for sure. Yeah, JD, is there something maybe you picked up since you've been on the pro side and the college side that you didn't have back in little league that might have you know might have been of help at that point? Yeah, I think it's repeatability of my delivery. Um, like I said, focusing on those little drills. Those are drills that I started when I was seven and didn't really understand the importance of them. Um, but going back now, those are the same drills I refer back to whenever I'm ha whenever I have a bad start. Those are the first two drills that I go back to. So just being able to repeat my delivery and get to the same points over and over again to be as repeatable as possible. I know in the multiple, uh, the many many conversations I've had with coaches in, in all sports. Uh, they always say, you know, if you're a hockey player, you know, play other sports, but baseball, play football. What other sports did you guys play? Justin, what what other sports were you involved in growing up? Um, I was a soccer player when I was really young. Um, dabbled in football, didn't like getting hit. Um, Nothing then, wrong with that. I understand. And, <laughs> and then the, uh, the basketball gene skipped me. I played, but it went to my brother, so I was not very good. I always had 5,000 to get when I was playing CYO in high school ball. Oh, I gave all five. Yeah, good. <laughs> Try not to give them all up in the first half, but you know, how about you? How about you, Joe? What other sports did you get involved with? I played soccer mostly uh, up until up until high school when I just went to, uh, for baseball. I was actually the goalie. I don't know if that made me a bad actual player, and they just stuck me in the goal. But uh, uh, I, I didn't think I was too bad. I, I enjoyed playing soccer. Um, and I only played. Uh, I never played football. I only play, you know, I play, I play golf recreationally. I never really played. Um, I never really played um, uh, in high school or anything like that, but um, yeah, so, uh, soccer and, and baseball were the two. Goalie. So you gotta, you, you gotta have some ups, man. I mean, you get some of those high, you know, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have ups now. Goalie. I actually, yeah, I actually didn't have ups when I was a goalie. I don't know. If, uh, I, I do remember <laughs> not being able to get all the way up there, but you know, I also wasn't as tall as I am now. So perhaps, you know, I'd be, I'd be better now. It's, you know. So how, so you were goalie at what age? Oh man, that would have been if I played until high school. That would have been I don't know. I was 
16, 17. I played until, uh, yeah, yeah, about maybe maybe younger, maybe 13 or 14. Wow. Diving saves, two hands deflection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are the pictures. Old. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Um, the, it, Justin, we all have coaches that were, you know, big impact on us when you were young. Uh, give me, uh, give me a, a little background on maybe a coach who was very big in your development uh, on your way to the major leagues. You know, when yeah, you, got, you were in that 10 to 15 range. Okay, I got two. So one is my pitching coach from home um, who just is focusing on teaching me how to be the best version of myself and understanding that this yourself is really all you have and, and how to grow and be able to coach yourself on the fly, which for us and our job is very important. We don't have much time to really make corrections. Um, so first and foremost, he's one of the most important people. Um, and I didn't really realize that as a kid. And then the other is my high school coach, Jeff Trundy, who was one of the people who worked with me day in and day out um, when I went to boarding school and we would work together every weekend. So um, he's the first person that kind of really taught me work ethic. Wow, nice. I always remember those guys, right, Dylan? Yeah, absolutely. Mine is uh, mine is Eric Martin. He was uh, Eric Martin is I believe now he's in the uh, he's with the 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 Oakland A's uh, and coaching there. And uh, he was uh, I met him uh, when I was playing travel ball uh, around maybe thirteen or fourteen. And uh, you know I loved the game. I had a passion for the game, but uh, maybe I wasn't as focused as I should have been. And I remember him taking me aside and say, Hey, listen, you could be really good, but you have to give this a hundred percent. And I noticed that maybe you're just here for uh, a good time with your friends, but if you want to be really good and I can see that in you, you need to be a little more focused. And I'll, I'll always uh, remember him. And I always thank him when I see him uh, for kind of uh, uh, screwing my head on straight a little bit in that regard, you know, adolescent teenager kind of, you know, thinks he's thinks he knows everything. And, uh, you know, he really set me straight and uh, was a big part in uh, my career. It's nice to have that moment at that time of your life, you know, and that definitely, definitely. Really straightens you out and, mm -hmm. and gets you going. Well, guys, it's been a blast. I'm sure a lot of the kids have enjoyed hearing your, you know, things from your background and things that have gotten you here to the major leagues and having success. We appreciate your time and uh, thanks so much and look forward to seeing you real soon. Um, thank you, Dave. Appreciate you. Yep. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> You know, it's interesting you hear those professional athletes talk about the coaches that made a big impact uh, on their careers, even at a young age. And so it's just a reminder uh, to those coaches that are watching today to make sure, you know, you're that coach that encourages these players to continue in the game um, and, and not be one of the coaches as to the reason why they stopped uh, playing the game because unfortunately that that does happen too. Um, right now I want to remind everybody, uh, coaches and players, uh, to go ahead and start using the Q and A function and go ahead and start typing in your questions. We're going to get to go uh, to get to those questions in uh, just a little bit. But let's break down with with Tom and Bill a little bit about what we heard there with Dylan and uh, Don as well. Um, Bill, I know you're a big proponent of balance. And you heard Justin talk about that uh, and the ability to repeat as well. I know that you, you believe it's really important to be able to have that skill. Yeah. Balance is pretty critical. Uh, I do a little drill with kids uh, when I, when I, when I get together with my do a clinic for, for kids or whatever it might be. And uh, we do a drill without the baseball. We got the glove. We got our feet on a, on a hypothetical mound with your feet parallel, much like we had talked about with the T that I was referring to. And you need to make sure that you bring your knee up to a point, as I would say, you want to make your knee up to a point where you can put mom's best meal on that, on that knee and it won't spill. So you got to get that knee up to parallel and uh, you got to be able to come up and hold that position. We would make the kids hold that position for 10 seconds and they may not get there right away. Uh, there's a little bit of a nuance there. You want to make sure that you aren't standing really erect. You want those shoulders to kind of accordion forward. So you kind of have your weight, as I say, over the mound and you want your hands in the middle of your body. And I, and I think it's important to have your hands a little bit away from your body because I think that in, it, it in effect gives you that balance, gets you that weight over the rubber. Uh, again, we're talking about making sure your leg comes up parallel to the rubber and coming up to that place where you don't want to spend, spill mom's best spaghetti on a white carpet floor. So uh, balance is really, really important. And, uh, you know, like anything, uh, being a great uh, marksman with a, with a bow and arrow or, or uh, being a great foul shooter um, or being a great pitcher, it's, it's repetition. 
Uh, you and, have to uh, repeat something over and over again to be successful. Absolutely. And and there is no substitute for reps. Um, Tom, we heard Dylan uh, right there talk about the fact that he, he really um, thinks it's important to use that warm up time. And I know kids, they get together a lot of times when they're going through their stretch and that's the fun time to connect and everything. But I really liked his idea of, you know, using the warm up time. If, if you're taking a throw, maybe you, you know, you pretend like you're doing a relay. I used to have a coach that said like, um, go ahead and slap down the tag. But, you know, there are, are opportunities, you know, every single time you go out um, and they're not just the ones in front of you, but there's, there's the game within the game, Tom. Yeah. I mean, you can't put a price tag on repetition either. I mean, it, you know, you do things the right way. And like I said before, your body is going to take over and do them in situations when you don't have time uh, to think about it. You know, when, when, when you, when you, once you get loose and your body's loose and you go jump in the cage and it's time to hit, you know, there's, there's a time maybe to take the ball the other way, but if you can try to put yourself in a game frame of mind, then um, all of a sudden your body reacts differently than if it's in a laid back, um, just getting loose type of mind, you know? So I, when I got in the cage, I like to try to think of it as a game situation that I'm trying to execute because, you know, your body has a tendency to speed up in a game. Your adrenaline gets going. You, you, you're just, you're, you're a little bit more uh, aware and, and excited about everything during, during the actual game. So if you can try to simulate that in practice, whether it's playing catch, whether it's feeling ground balls, whether it's you know throwing balls down to the second, whether you're in the cage, then you're more likely to execute that when you get into the game. So I would say that you know, our practice times are, are important to, to focus on those times. I mean, it's a short period of time that you're in the cage or a short period of time that you're fielding ground balls or a short period of time that I'm throwing balls to second. So I got to have the mental capacity to, when I get in that situation, to concentrate as best as I can and try to put myself in a game situation because I'm more likely to accomplish that during a game if I do. Yeah. And a lot of times with young kids, you know, these coaches have limited time on these fields. And, and I always try to stress to kids, um, go ahead and, and make sure you get your at bat before the at bat. You know, you're only going to get maybe eight swings in the cage. Um, so go ahead and time up, you know, whoever's throwing you BP or, you know, time up whoever is, uh, you know, feeding balls in the machine before you actually step up to the plate, get your timing down so that, you know, when you do get in there, you you are ready to go. And then um, one other thing I was going to add, um, a lot of times after long toss, I would have my teams come in and, and whatever that distance they're throwing, whether it's 90 feet or 60 feet, um, that you're doing 10 to win. So you're trying to hit your partner, um, you know, in the chest and the first team that between the two partners has gotten 10 throws and you got to keep each other honest. Um, but, uh, 10 to win. So the first person to 10, you guys win, and then we're done. We're done, uh, getting our arms warmed up. Uh, I want to ask really quick, we'll make this short cause we got a lot of other videos that we've got to get to, but I heard the guys talk about coaches that made an impact. And I'm wondering from each one of you, Tom, I'm going to start with you this time. Um, just a coach that either said, something or a bit of advice you got that um, that really uh, made an impact on you? Because I think it's important for these young coaches and, and older coaches, you know, that are, are watching this to understand the impact that they have uh, on these young kids. Yeah, you know, there was, uh, I, I would have to say that my father, without a doubt, um, was the first and biggest influence in my life uh, when it came to sports. Um, he loved sports. Um, he made it available to us. He was always there to play catch with us. He was always there to, to promote us, to get out there and to do it and to push us. Um, and he had a love for baseball. So I would have to say my dad first and foremost, but I would also say, um, and I have to, I have to say that, um, there's a guy in Redmond right now named Jim Stewart, who a lot of you guys probably know from back then it was insulate insulation service, Wick Holmes, uh, Chafee. I don't know what it's called now. Billy, you probably know him too, but, um, but I can remember times when my dad would take me over to Jim Stewart's house and, and I would sit in his living room at 13, 14 years old. And I'd be down on my knees with my, with my hands in the position to block that hole. And he would throw balls at me and bounce them off his carpet for hours, trying to get me to get into that position. And just little stuff like that to force your body to do things without thinking of them was huge for me. I mean, I, I, I like to believe that one of the reasons I stuck around as long as I did was because I defensively, I was, I was solid. My mechanics were solid, at least early in the year until my body started failing me. But, 
but those types of things, coaches out there, it, it spend time with these kids. You know, there's no excuse why you can't pull YouTube videos off, um, off the internet on big league players that put this stuff out there to show you how to run drills. Right? There's no reason that we shouldn't have the, the proper education to teach these kids and make yourself available. And I'm going to end on one note, Ange, the, the, the best coaches that I had in, in my whole career, especially when I can say in pro ball were coaches that made themselves available to the players. You know, when you get to that big league level, there's not a lot of teaching per se that goes on, but these guys make themselves available to, to encourage and to watch when things go good and things go bad and offer suggestions. So be a part of these kids' lives, be encouraging to them and make them want to play the game. Yeah. And I, I, I always kind of stress the sandwich technique and that is say something good, maybe put a little meat in there and then end with something good, you know, realize yeah, you know, to the coaches out here that they are, that, that, that you are teaching young kids and, and so many kids dread, you know what they dread the most about sports, the car ride home with their parents. Um, because that's when mom or dad gets in and starts pinging on it. Like the one thing I say to my kids every single time, boy, it sure was fun to watch you play. Boy, I love watching you play the game. It sure was fun. And that's it. Mm -hmm. They want to talk about yeah. the game. They can bring it on. But that's the only thing I ever say to my kids. Bill, what about you with a coach? Uh, you know, A bit of advice you got. Well, I, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, that, uh, that everybody's got talent and that there's a, a special thing about everyone. And a lot of times that specialness gets stolen from kids. And I want to reinforce with kids that if there's a dream that you have, you can keep it. You don't have to share it with anyone and it can be yours and nobody can ever take it from you. No friend, no coach, no parent. No one can take that dream from you. And don't, uh, don't let that happen. Uh, for me, that's the, the, the reason why I was able to find my way into the big leagues. Uh, the coach that probably had the biggest influence on me was my high school basketball coach. Uh, again, he really believed in me, had access keys to the gym, hard work pays, but also a guy that just made me so fundamentally solid and really helped to take um, kind of a guy that was trying to grow into his body into a, 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 a D1 player in two years. I mean, it just, it just was sort of miraculous that I could have landed on a coach that was that uh, influential. And he's the one that opened the door. I was not uh, a guy that was getting D1 letters uh, but he created an opportunity for me by making phone calls and believing in that I was a dime in the rough guy that just hadn't been seen enough that was growing into his body. And, uh, and we still talk today. Uh, he's one of my best friends, his second winning as coach in Oregon high school history. So um, that's the person that's really a difference maker for me. I know it wasn't a baseball story, um, no, but I think it's really important that, you know, we, we get, we get lots of different coaches and, and I had a really difficult coach uh, that I played basketball for in college that really took the game away from me. And then I had a college coach that played that Tom played for that gave it back to me, that believed in me. I walked on the baseball field uh, 10 minutes after taking off my uh, my gear from basketball. And within uh, a couple of days time, he's telling me that I got a chance to be a pro Joe Wetzel. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. belief's a big deal. And when you can get when when you express belief in someone, you can ask them to do a lot. You can ask them to really work hard because they know that someone believes in them. I, you, you literally took the words out of my mouth um, that you will be amazed at what someone can accomplish when they believe that someone believes in them. Uh, that was my story as well. You know, I, I, I didn't play in all the travel ball teams and I didn't do all those things, but um, I assure you, you know, I went much further uh, with the playing D1 softball and then pro baseball after that than, than any of those, uh, those other people on my, on my high school team that, you know, had all the things and, and, and played for all the teams. So, you know, if you love it, and, and you have some encouragement along the way and you just never give up, um, you know, you can get to the places that you want to get to. Uh, so let's, uh, right now, we're going to get a few more tips. And these are some really good ones from Mariners players and coaches right now on drills that you can work at home or on a field with to help you uh, find a way to play. Hey guys, Jordan Cowan here. I want to show you a couple of hitting drills I've been doing at home during this time away from the field. As you see in my hand, I have a five foot long PVC pipe. If you do not have one laying around your house, I would recommend getting one at either Home Depot or Lowe's. The first drill I like to show you is called the stop swing drill. Make sure you have no one around you. 
having plenty of room inside your house or garage, getting your normal baseball stance, and hold the PVC pipe just like you would a bat. You will then take a full swing up until the point of contact. And what you should feel with the PVC pipe is a slight bend, and when we get to the stop part of the swing, it should then whip right out in front. And here's how you do it. I recommend doing that three sets of 10 every single day. The second drill I'd like to show you is called the side bend drill. Again, I would recommend doing it with a PVC pipe, but if you are not able to get one, you can even use a household broom. The purpose of this drill is to learning how to adjust at different pitch heights. Put the PVC pipe or broom in front of your chest about shoulder height. You will then get in your normal baseball stance and you will then take half swings to the point of contact at different pitch heights. Elevated pitch, low pitch. As you can see, the only difference part of those swings is the lower the pitch, the more side bend I have. Also, the more elevated the pitch, the flatter the PVC pipe was, and the lower the pitch, the more vertical the PVC pipe was. I would also recommend doing that three sets of 10 every single day. I hope this video really helps you. Please continue to wash your hands and stay at home as much as possible and go Mariners. Hey guys, it's Cal Raleigh. You're my little brother. We're gonna take you through two catching drills that you can do at home during this time. First drill, you draw a chalk line right on the wall about eye level. If it's above the line, I want you to catch in the air. If it's below the line, I want you to try to block it up. Okay, let's show them to you. All right, get somebody from behind to throw it to you above it catch it if it's below it lock it up good if it's above the line catch it if it's below the line lock it up good all right and the second drill will take you through you can draw a ladder here as you can see chalk or if you have ladders at home you're gonna get it right here you're gonna throw it against the wall and you're gonna work on your footwork you want to stay right in the middle on the blue line show them to you Good. 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 Hey, this is Rob Marcello, and here's a drill for pitchers to help with hitting locations. What you need is a tennis ball, wiffle ball, baseball, and a target to throw into. My name is Maddie. I'm three. All right, throw the balls into the net. Good. Pick up the other ball. Good, pick up the other one. I'm Demi, and I'm two. Okay, Demi, throw the balls. Good, pick up the other ball. Good. Pick up the baseball. Hi, I'm Kara, Ron Marcel's wife, Maddie, and Demi's mom. Okay. To make this drill more challenging, what you can do is you can increase the distance or add different balls to throw into a target, like so. Hey there, Brad Adam with Root Sports here at home, like everybody else in this very difficult time, just trying to do our part, staying safe, keeping our social distance like everybody else out there. We'll get through this, no doubt, together. All right. Now, the kids are doing school from home like everybody else, and I'm in charge of the P part of the schedule. Once they hit geometry and math, I bowed out, but I can handle the P part. Anything with a ball, we're good at. Now, we know that softball and baseball season is postponed right now, but the girls want to stay sharp. They want to keep uh, doing drills, so when the play does resume, they're ready to go. This is a fielding drill that we like to do at home, inside or outside. If it's a nice day like this, I like to do it outside. You can do it with a glove, without a glove, one ball. Uh, keep the kid about 10, 15 feet in front of you. And this is just a side-to-side -side lateral quickness drill, fielding drill. And the keys of this is keeping an athletic stance like this. And when you slide side to side, you want to keep, right, you, you want to keep your feet apart. You don't want to stand up. You don't want to cross your feet. You lose your balance. So what you do, you just roll it. You field it in front of you, right in the middle. And in front of you. That's right. Side to side. Keep moving. Keep moving. I like this too because you have grass, the cement, and the surfaces. Keep moving. Here, next up. Rotate, let's go. Everybody's in. 
Here we go, rotate. And this is good drill. The lateral quickness, like I mentioned, for other sports as well, like volleyball, basketball, tennis. This is a good drill for all to do. And then if you have some resistance bands here, challenge yourself a little bit more. Same drill, but this will be harder to do with the resistance bands here. Nice job. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. I like that. All right, so again, inside or outside, one ball, you can use a glove, back it up if you want to, go a little harder. Keep them moving, keep them outside, keep them active. Keep them thinking about softball, baseball, because you want them to be ready, of course, when baseball and softball, when they resume, because they will. Right, girls? Yeah! yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and I know that uh, Brad spends a lot more time uh, coaching his girls in basketball than he does in softball, but they're looking good. They're looking good, Brad. Um, all right, so let's break down um, some of these drills. Bring back Bill Kruger and Tom Lampkin. I loved... Uh, by the way, Kent Lake High School graduate uh, Jordan Cowan's drill uh, with the uh, PVC pipe, Tom, and, and cards face up. I actually had some PVC pipe and I was like, I am going to go and saw five uh, foot sections of this. But I really like this because I think a lot of times, um, you know, kids can get confused because you think like, OK, I got to hit down on the ball. But at the same time, we do have to remember that, you know, we do have to angle our shoulders, you know, towards the pitch height. And it's a good idea to remember this with our shoulders versus sort of collapsing our backside and our back leg and everything. But just to, it's, I thought that was a really great drill to, um, to teach yourself kind of to get on plane um, with the height of the pitch. Yeah, I, I, I've never seen PVC pipe used for that. I've got some out back that I, I usually do some sprinkler system repairs with. But you're welcome. I, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> but but no, but I mean, it, it, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, we talked about balance earlier, you know, balance is key to, to anything. I mean, occasionally you'll you'll run across a guy that maybe doesn't have great balance or doesn't have great mechanics. And they're just they're just so gifted or so talented that their their ability gets them by. But for the most part, yeah, th those are good drills to check your balance with. I think the most important or one of the most important things that I, I got out of that drill and I, I, I would like I would emphasize is the fact that he's doing these you know 10 to 15 times you know you know sets of three you know or you know three sets of 15 reps those are the important things because the more we drive these things into our into our mechanics into our body our muscle memory the more likely we are to repeat that later because remember these environments are controlled when you're standing in your living room with a pvc pipe on your on your you know your shoulders or if you're if you're taking thought you know thoughtful swings where you're stopping halfway and checking yourself, these are opportunities we have to think about our swings because in the games we can't. So we try to in controlled situations we try to do things over and over with mirrors or checking ourselves so that when we get in a game we're more likely to repeat that. I, I agree, and you know a lot of times um, you know you might not be able to set up your camera and and video yourself and look at things frame by frame. But I always say you know the best coach you find a mirror. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because you are not going to lie to yourself. You know you think that you're keeping that backside up, or you think that that elbow is higher than your shoulder, but then all of a sudden you realize no, it it really mm -hmm. isn't. You know, go ahead and go through that, that throwing motion. Um, and so, Bill, I, I know you have a lot of different drills. It, it, um, uh, Rob Marcello um, showed us the one with the, the net. And and I like that because that works for, for all ages. Um, but I think it's also good. I know you do a lot of things at, at hitting locations and making sure you're working on those. So there's, there's a lot of different variations of this, if you will. Yeah, I think uh, having a target uh, and setting that target up uh, and working to the target, that it just allows you to have, uh, you know, in an environment where you don't have to have a catcher. Um, I've had a target that, I, that I've that i used in the past that really, um, really defines the outer and inner third of the strike zone. And I think it's, it's, it's a good tool, not, not because a, a 11 or 12 year old, you're going to put him at pitching distance and he's going to paint each side of the plate time after time after time. That's just not realistic because we got to just use the strike zone and get ahead, right? So what you can do with it is I say, cut this, cut the distance of throwing distance in half. And let's throw three, uh, three sets of 10 maybe, or three sets of 15 on each side and keep track. And if you can get to 60%, 18 out of 30, let's say, then you move back three feet. 
And you got to do a lot of things right with your mechanics and throw it like you're going to pitch in a game, not trying to throw it as hard as you can, but throw it with a full delivery and work on trying to go to the inner and outer third. And what happens is much like what Tom's talking about. Muscle memory takes over. And I tell kids, you know what muscle memory is? And they go, oh, it's uh, like you can think you don't think about it. And I go, that's right. It's sort of like, you know, growing up in the Midwest where you actually put your bike away in the winter and you had to break it out in the spring. Hey, you jump on that thing and you're doing six or seven things at once without thinking. I go, that is muscle memory. And that's what you do with repeating a, a baseball swing or working on sides of the plate. And all of a sudden you feel what fastball away, what it feels like, because that's what you want to get to when you want to have success in a game. Yeah, a really good uh, points, you guys. Um, now we're going to kind of uh, open things up and we'll continue to talk about uh, the games within the game. And I, I think, Bill, what you said, you know, the competition aspect if, is so important, you know, and, um, you know, it, it really is a, a challenge for a lot of these coaches when you have maybe one or two of you. How do I keep everybody involved? You know, and, and that's the hard and that's a struggle a lot of times with baseball is you know, if you just have somebody at bat and you got nine other people and everybody's picking in the grass and, you know, you've got to find a way to kind of keep things fun and keep everybody moving. And again, drills within that, um, you know, are a really fun way to keep everybody engaged. All right. So um, right now I want to remind you uh, if you're joining us virtually uh, that you can type your questions into the chat and Bill uh, and Tom or myself will be able to answer them for you. Baseball, softball, uh, kids, uh, coaches, doesn't matter. So let's start getting to uh, let's start getting to our questions. And uh, and again, we'll try to answer them for you. Our first question: How about this? When kids are pitching, should they land on their heel or balls of their feet with their stride foot? Tom, I know you want to take this, but I'm going to give it to Bill. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's a misnomer to think that you're just going to land on your toe because that's just not realistic. You're going to land, um, you know, you're going to land. You just don't want to land on a stiff, a stiff land leg. You don't want to be so far out that you're landing on your heel and and, and almost recoiling back. You got to land where you have, you know, a, a, a nice, you know, as I say, kind of a soft foot land. It goes heel to toe. Um and, and you're landing where you're able to get over your front side and follow through. So I don't think it's necessarily something that you try to, you know, land on the, on, on the, on the, on the, on those, those pads of your toes. I don't think that's realistic because you'll have a tendency to kind of flop forward and, uh, you know, being able to be dynamic, uh, in a delivery, it takes flexibility and strength. And you take a guy, let's just say like a Tim Liscom, you know, that was, uh, you know, a wiry little guy that wasn't very big or strong, but, you know, he really got the most out of his body and he had a long stride. And a long stride gets you closer to the plate. That's why, you know, there's velocity and perceived velocity. You got a guy like Greg Maddox, the gun says 89, but he's striding so far down the, down the, down the uh, mound because he's very flexible and dynamic. So uh, I'm probably getting way over the, uh, the ski tips on tech technology, tech techniques here at technique, but um, I think it's probably uh, more of a heel to toe kind of land. Yeah. And uh, if some people will follow Tom House on on Twitter, and, and I remember he just tweeted something out uh, the other day is like every single one foot closer to the plate is three miles per hour as far as the perception of the hitter. And that's that's a really big difference if you're throwing, you know, 90 to 93. So uh, that's, that's a big difference. OK, so our next question. And again, Please keep them coming in the chat. We'll try to get to the as many of them as we can. What do you recommend that coaches players focus on as they return to the field with their teams this spring? I'm going to let Tom answer this, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to interject my little two cents before Tom goes. I think it's really important. And I understand that, um, you know, as young kids, you're, you're trying to get your foot under the game or your feet under you with the game. Um, and I know a lot of times that the pitcher is the best player at the young ages, but the pitcher, Felix Hernandez, uh, James Paxton, uh, name the pitcher. They are never the cutoff to home. And the more you can teach your kids the right way to play the game, scaffold it. You have to keep it simple. OK, but the more you can teach them the right way to play the game, the more it has to or the excuse me, the less it has to get unripped later. You know, these guys can make it to level 21 on Fortnite. They can understand that the first baseman is the cut from right field and center and 
left field's cut is third base. They can grasp this. I promise you they can, but you need to teach them this. So I, that's, that's my little two cents is like, when we get back to the game, teach the game the right way. You can teach the game the right way at a young level, you know, and just stop the, the second baseman, the short stop, always running out, throw it to me. We, we, you know, let's get away from that habit. Let's, let's know where you're going and you'll be better off, you know, as you move through the game, if you have a better baseball IQ, but Tom, what do you think people should be, be focusing on besides keeping things fun, which is also really important. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is definitely important. And, and since you wouldn't let me answer the question, Bill, I, I want to just touch on that because it kind of answers kind of piggybacks on what you were saying. <clears throat> I think, I think for me, um, learning pitching was an important part of catching the, the battery, the, the pitchers and catchers are so, I mean, they, they got to work together. And um, the more I got to learn about pitching, the better catcher I was. So kind of to go along the lines with what you were saying, which I believe is extremely important is you've got to know the game from multiple positions. And if you're a good coach, I coached in high school for eight years after I got done playing. And I want to teach my kids, not only their position, but what other people do too, because the, you're going to be better if you understand what other people are doing. And I'll, I'll be it, it's, it's a lot easier for me to catch than it was be to go out to play first base like I had to do one time or right field like I felt I was the only person within 10 mile radius of anybody. It was horrible. But I still understand the other positions. And I think that as coaches, we can teach those types of things too. It makes it easier to catch when you understand what the third baseman is dealing with or what you understand you understand pitching a little bit, or you understand the cutoff and relay system. And like we said before, that stuff is available on YouTube. It's available um, by guys that played the game at the highest level you can play it. So, you know, for, for the coaches out there, take, take an opportunity. If you don't know any big league players or pro players, take an opportunity to look at some of that stuff, because there's a reason that they do stuff like they're up that or up there like that. It's the easiest way to teach it. It's the right way to play. You're going to get a lot. You're going to, you guys are going to have more fun. They're going to learn the game. They have an opportunity to go a little bit further when they learn the game the right way. There is a uh, website, and I, I think, and I, I don't have the exact address, but you could uh, Bing it, Google it. Um, and it's Ye Old Ball Game, and it, they have a ton of drills and fun little things to do. Um, and and Mariners.com has a whole bunch of uh, tips as well. But um, they have, they have. If you don't know the situations and who's supposed to be where on a ball hit to right with runners on f first and second, you know they'll, they'll break it all down for you so that you can, you know, to help teach the kids. So as Tom keeps saying, and I completely agree with you, I don't want to say there's no excuse, but there's no excuse. There is no, there's excuse. no excuse. There's so much information out there to make this fun, to put together a, a good practice plan so that, you know, um, everybody is busy and everybody is in, engaged. So, um, all right. So I, I want to get it through as many of these questions as we possibly can, because I know the fans at home are just like me. They just want to talk, talk, talk Tom and Bill's ear off. So um, please make sure you get your questions in and we'll keep uh, firing through as many as we can get through. What is the most important thing to know about hitting? Well, I gave you mine is that is keeping your head still because you can have the greatest swing in the world, but if you can't see the ball or you're not, you're not able to see the ball, you're not going to hit anything. You can have the worst swing in the world, but if you keep your head still, you'll at least be able to make contact with it. So that's mine. That's mine. Balance is another big thing. Tom, when you think about hitting, what are the things fundamentally that have to be there? You think uh, in order for a hitter to be a good one? Well, yeah, I, I agree with all that. There's a, there's tons of fundamentals that go into making a good hitter. Um, I, I personally believe um, I think the most important thing to be a good hitter is you got to believe that you can hit. Yeah, I played with guys that that were that talked themselves into being good hitters, that told themselves they were better hitters, that convinced themselves that they were good hitters. And it starts with, you know, your mind and your preparation. And once you feel like you're ready and you you've got your swing together, you've got your your work in, then you got to take a game plan into the batter's box and you got to try to execute it. But but you 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 need to be aggressive. You need to have a game plan and you need to believe that you can hit those, those three things, I think, and that's all mental, that's controllable. Those are things that we can encourage people to do. We can, we can, we can, you know, show them how to do it. And then it's up to them to take it into the box to do it.
Yeah. And uh, Bill, I'm going to ask you this question too, because you are a fantastic hitter uh, in your own right as well. You know, one thing I, I'm always telling people, um, it, it, you know, to, to piggyback on what Tom's saying is you got to, you know, believe you can hit, but you also have to be ready to hit. You can't step in the box and go, is this going to be a good pitch? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yes. Every single time you got to be thinking, yes, 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 and pull the trigger or yes, 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 no. You know, ambivalence doesn't work in the batter's box. You can't, you know, see the pitch and then start everything, you know, and begin everything. You're going to be too late, never going to work. Well, I, 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 as far as hitting goes, uh, I don't know that I got a ton of instruction. I, I, I mimicked my heroes when I was a kid. When I had, you know, I knew every hitter in the Cubs lineup as a kid. You know, I grew up in Chicago, and so I imitated all the hitters, and I probably developed some bad habits. And when I got to college, you know, I, I was so busy with basketball, I just showed up and played. And so I never really, really had a good. Um, I had a really high elbow when I hit. And it's so funny. I got into the pros and I was in uh, Albuquerque in 1988 uh, with the Dodgers trying to work my way up to the big leagues. And Von Joshua was a hitting coach and Terry Collins is our manager. And we needed an extra player. And they said, hey, you can hit with the group because you're going to be our an extra player in case we need it. So I hit with the group and, and I hit and I hit some balls. You know, it was BP. And uh, Von pulls me over. He was a big league hitter for a long time with the Dodgers. He goes, what's with the high elbow? I go, I don't know. That's how I hit. He goes, let me show you something. Put rest of the bat on your shoulder. Okay. You got the bat, you know, like you're chopping a piece of wood. Yeah, okay. Then you put that bat on your shoulder. Now, when you get ready to hit, just take your hands off your shoulder. And I started doing that, and all of a sudden, I could hit the I could hit the breaking ball a little bit, and I could hit the ball that was in the inner half of the plate because all I could do was hit the ball the opposite way. And from that point forward, believe it or not, I hit. I hit some home runs in the minor leagues. I hit in my short stint in the big leagues. I hit, you know, six for 15. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm not going to say that's gonna that was going to stand forever, but – um, that was the one tip that I got and I never got a tip for hitting the whole time. Uh, you know, really other than what Von Joshua did for me in 1988, that's that a long time in my tip, life. That is a pretty good tip. And, and sometimes keep it simple is just the best uh, piece of advice. Uh, no doubt about that. So I think we have chance for one more question and we're going to have to be really quick in answering it as well. My six-year-old still struggles catching a ball consistently. Do you have any tricks to help? My two cents, and again, everybody's going to have to be quick with this one. Um, teach your six-year-old how to play catch with a tennis ball because your your kid won't be as afraid. Sometimes, you know, a lot of them being afraid to catch the ball is is their fear of the actual ball. And if you learn how to play with a tennis ball, you get hit in the face, it's not going to hurt, and they're going to want to keep at it. Uh, guys, uh, let's start with you, Bill. Sorry. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. A softer ball is a good idea. Start a short distance and work on the ball at you. How are you going to receive it? The ball that's on your glove side, how are you going to receive it? And then more importantly, that ball that's on the opposite side that you have to cross over. And just work on those three catches and get them used to understanding where the glove needs <clears> to be in order to be successful in those three balls. All right, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I've I dealt with that with my son. Uh, I do only dividing it. Bill said three ways. I did it four ways. So you okay. have a figure across in front of you. You got this one. You got this one. You got that one. And then you got that one. Good but point. essentially, it's the same thing. You, you have to realize when to turn your hand over and when to turn your hand over this way. And then uh, catch the ball out in front. Remember, the ball moves a lot faster the closer it gets to you. So if you can catch a ball out in front of you, then your eyes don't have to make that adjustment as fast. So everything out in front here and just throw 10, 15 balls there. And then 10, 15 here, and you'll realize the difference that you have to make. You're crossing over your eyes. Then 10, 15 here and then there. And, and then you start mixing and matching. Tennis balls are good, or you can do it with a hard ball. But as long as they keep their glove out in front and work on those four quad quadrants, that's the way I like to teach it. But definitely down to the fundamentals of catching like that. That is great, you guys. And that is really a fantastic advice. I wish that we could stay here uh, for like three more hours. Uh, but unfortunately, we are going to have to uh, wrap things up. Um, Tom, Bill, I cannot thank you guys enough. And uh, I hope that we can do this again soon. And maybe we, we are able to do it all in person. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Enjoy folks, it very uh, much. Okay, that is uh, going to wrap up our virtual baseball and softball clinic. 
Um, we hope you learned a few things. Uh, I know I did. Um, I, I, I love the quadrant, the four quadrant drill that, that jo Tom just told us about. Every single time I talk to Bill, I learned something new, no doubt about it. I'm so lucky that he gets to sit next to me uh, at Root Sports. And we want to thank Root Sports um, for their support of today's event. And if you missed anything, uh, you joined us late, don't worry about it. If you want to watch today's event again, all you have to do is go to mariners.com slash community tour. And uh, if you go there, you can also see the one that we did with Ryan Roland Smith and Brian Hunter as well. So thank you so much. So long to everybody on behalf of the Mariners. I want to say go Mariners and thank you so very much.